After an 11 day investigation, the Secret Service says it cannot determine who owned Hunter Biden's cocaine. The cocaine was found in the White House, lodged in the butt crack of a prostitute who came to light when agents lifted Hunter Biden's unconscious body off her in order to carry him to bed. The Secret Service says the discovery was made in a restricted area of the White House, officially called the Game Room, but sometimes referred to as Hunter's Ha Ha Hole or the Big Nostril. After working through the night, Investigators say they are completely baffled in their attempt to identify the owner of Hunter's cocaine, but they did confirm the coke was of high grade and was very useful in helping them work through the night. Secret Service spokesman Agent Sino Weevil announced the results of the investigation to reporters in between sniggering into his sleeve and bursting into helpless laughter while slapping his knee and winking broadly at other federal law officials who were also laughing. Agent Weevil said, quote, In trying to identify the owner of Hunter Biden's cocaine, the Secret Service worked closely with the investigators at the Department of Justice who tried to identify the owner of Hunter Biden's $10 million in bribes. And while our efforts were similarly unsuccessful, I would like to point out that the DOJ had to wait five years for the statute of limitations to run out while we were far more efficient and just farted around for 11 days than lied, unquote. Agent Weevil said the Secret Service investigation into who owned Hunter Biden's cocaine demonstrated competence in the oldest tradition of the service, which was created to protect the president of the United States by Abraham Lincoln on April 14, 1865, the day before Lincoln was assassinated. Altogether, six of 31 presidents have been shot on the Secret Service's watch, which is a success rate of around 80 percent. Not bad if you don't mind losing 20 percent of your presidents. Agent Weevil added, however, that those previous failures were due to rank incompetence, whereas the current failure was merely the result of corruption reaching to the highest levels of American government. The failed investigation into who owned Hunter Biden's cocaine was considered to be of such great importance that the agent in charge woke up the president to inform him of the results. Biden was in an Oval Office meeting with Israeli President Isaac Herzog at the time and was so startled at being awakened, he sat up straight in his chair, shouting, holy crap, I'm surrounded by Jews, unquote. After the president was reassured that President Herzog would not kill him and use his blood to make matzah, President Biden laughed and said he always knew Congresswoman Jayapal had just made that story up to frighten him. Biden then apologized for falling asleep in the meeting, but said he had been finding it difficult to stay awake ever since his son had lost his stash of cocaine in a prostitute's butt crack down in his ha-ha hole. Attorney General Merrick Scarface Garland remarked on the investigation in a statement written into the wall of a Chicago garage with bullets from a Tommy gun. The statement said, quote, even though federal investigators have failed to discover who owned Hunter Biden's cocaine, I want to reassure the public that rank corruption at the highest levels of American government will not be tolerated by those of us at the highest levels of American government. No one is above the law, which is why we'll be indicting Donald Trump for the 17th time later this week, as soon as we can invent another barely plausible sounding crime to charge him with, unquote. Republican primary voters reacted angrily to news of the new Trump indictment. Mr. Angry McAngryface, the chairman of the Angry Association of Angry Republican Voters, so angry they're willing to lose every election just to express their anger, the A-A-A-R-V-S-A-T-W-L-E-E-J-T-E-T-A, stated his objections by screaming at his television set so loudly that a blood vessel in his neck swelled to the size of a gas pipeline and was then denied a permit by the Biden administration. Mr. McAngry Face said, quote, corrupt Democrat officials are unfairly indicting Trump just to make us so angry we nominate a presidential candidate who can't possibly win the general election. And we plan to get to work on that right away. Unquote. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Claven, and this is The Andrew Claven Show. All right, we are back laughing our way through the fall of the Republic. I'm back from vacation, another year older and uh, closer to death or deeper in debt. I can't remember how that song goes. This is a great time to subscribe to my personal YouTube channel, the Andrew Claven YouTube channel. We will give you exclusive content absolutely for free uh, if you just pay us a nominal fee and uh, then, you know, shine our shoes and wash our car. But it will arrive thrown through your window, tied to a brick, because, you know, that's the kind of thing we conservatives do. Also, leave a comment there. And if the comment is racist, hateful, sounds like a country song, by golly, we will read it on the air because it'll fit right in with the rest of our content. Today's comment is from Wyatt B. 3138 
He says, the most conservative people in my family say that being a filmmaker is always going to be a waste of time. And that's what my parents say also. But isn't it that kind of attitude that gave the film industry to the left when liberals encourage their kids to go to film school, whereas conservatives discourage their kids to do something more industrious? Yes, it is absolutely why the right lost the culture is also excellent, excellent advice. <laughs> Stay out of the arts. You will never make a living. All right, let's get to today's episode. They hate us so, so much. Carjacking old lady at a red light. Pull a gun on the owner of a liquor store. You think it's cool, act a fool if you like. Cuss out a cop, spit in his face. Stomp on the flag and light it up. Yeah, you think it's tough. Well, try that in a small town. See how far you make it down the road. That, as everybody now knows, is Jason Alding with Try That in a Small Town. Excellent song with a very powerful video to go with it that shows leftist violence, including the BLM and Antifa Summer of Hate riots in 2020. Uh, He was, of course, immediately attacked for being racist, a word that means shut up, we're leftist. And, of course, the utter weasels at the country music television uh, CWT, which is owned by Paramount, uh, cut the song, which then skyrocketed to number one on, I guess, on Spotify, uh, which is important. That's actually important to know because we, we have to remember, we have to learn now, we're learning this a little bit at a time, the cancelers are the minority. The corporations are powerful, but they are bowing to a minority. This is the lesson that we have tried to politely teach Bud Light, and now I hope maybe we'll teach it to uh, country western, uh, the western country music television. Uh, this leftist minority are full of hatred for everything that is basic and decent represented by the song. Yeah, Aldine is a conservative, and he's a Trump supporter who was there at the Las Vegas shooting, given a terrible shooting. We still have no idea, for some reason, why that went down. So it must have been something, you know, that damned leftism. And it's pretty clear from the lyrics of this video that this song has, has nothing to do with racism whatsoever. It's basically saying this. The violence of crime and the violence of riots are wrong, And in a small town, people have clear, ordinary human values, and they will be upheld by force if necessary, because men will uphold the human moral law. That's what they are there. That is what men are there to do. And they won't let it be theorized away by intellectuals in Ivy Towers. And he's not going to put, it's not about identity. It's not about whether your face is black or white. It's about whether your hat is black and white, whether you're a black hat or a white hat, a bad guy or a good guy. No one is above the moral law. That's what he's trying to say. And we know, we know that the people who went after Aldine, who called him racist, who called him names, we know they hate that message. They hate that message that there is a right and a wrong, and the wrong should be punished, and it is good when the wrong is punished. That is the message of the song that ordinary, down-home people who are not you know, intellectuals are not sitting around making up theories, but are living life in a community with one another, understand these values instinctively and should enforce them. They hate that message. We know this because they prosecuted Daniel Penny. They're prosecuting Daniel Penny, the New York subway hero. They, just like they prosecuted Kyle Rittenhouse, a young man who fired uh, a rifle in self-defense in the middle of the Kenosha riots. He fired it into a crowd Uh, He was shooting in self-defense, but he basically fired into a crowd of rioting leftists, this small minority of rioting leftists, and somehow, by an amazing, amazing chance, hit three criminals, two of them sex offenders, all of them white, but black hats. They're wearing black hats. That's what's important. We know from various other prosecutions of business owners defending themselves from criminals that this small, small, small minority who is terrorizing everybody and canceling anybody they can hate the ordinary human understanding of good and evil so much that they aren't just prosecuting people for defending themselves, they're actually calling for violence. Here is a clip of them calling for violence. Cut seven. I just don't even know why there aren't uprisings all over the country, and maybe there will be. People need to start taking to the streets. This is a dictator. You know, there needs to be unrest in the streets for as long as there is unrest in our lives. Enemies of the state. Show me where it says that protests are supposed to be polite and peaceful. Try that in a small town. See how far you make it down the road. 
you ever read the fine print that appears when you start browsing in incognito mode? Of course you didn't. Nobody reads that stuff. I'll tell you what it says. It says your activity might still be visible to your employer, your school, or your internet service provider. I don't even know why they call it an incognito. To really stop people from seeing the sites you visit, you need to do what I do and use Express VPN. Think about all the times you've used Wi-Fi at a coffee shop, a hotel, or even at your parents' house. Without Express VPN, every site you visit could be logged by the admin of that network, and that's still true even when you're in incognito mode. What's more, your home internet provider can also see and record your browsing data, and in the U.S., they're legally allowed to sell that data to advertisers. ExpressVPN is an app that encrypts all your network data and reroutes it through a network of secure servers so that your private online activity stays just that private. ExpressVPN works on all your devices. It's super easy to use. It has one button. Even I can do it. And your browsing activity is secure from prying eyes. Your data is your business. Protect it at expressvpn.com slash Clavin. Use my link at expressvpn.com slash Clavin to get three extra months free. That's expressvpn.com slash Clavin. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, sure, sure. But how do you spell VPN? It's K-L-A-V-A-N. All right, chapter one, they hate us more than they love their jobs. I hate, hate, hate your hair and makeup today. <laughs> they do. They're obsessed. Uh, Donald Trump says he's now going to be indicted, he believes, by the feds for a third time. He's been called to a grand jury by uh, David Weiss, the federal prosecutor who is uh, hounding him like Javert. Uh, and, and Weiss, we, we have to say here for a minute, he's another crappy Trump appointment. He's a Democrat guy. He's a guy who's served Democrats all his life, and Trump appointed him uh, as federal prosecutor, so he's kind of getting a little bit of his own poor appointments back in his face. This time, he feels that they're going to indict him for claiming the election was stolen and challenging the legitimacy of the president when he made statements like this. You can run the best campaign. You can even become the nominee. And you can have the election stolen from you. He knows he's an illegitimate president. He knows. He knows that there were a bunch of different reasons why the election turned out the way it did. Okay, that was probably not Donald Trump. That might have been Hillary Clinton. And you may ask why she wasn't indicted for saying such things, especially when she actually weaponized the FBI and the DOJ with a Russian collusion hoax in an attempt to overthrow our election. All Trump did was make a lot of fuss and a bunch of people went into the Capitol, which was bad, but he didn't in, in, encourage them to do that. But Democrats can explain why they are doing it so differently, why, for instance, they are prosecuting Trump for mishandling classified information, but didn't prosecute Hillary Clinton for mishandling classified information and then destroying the evidence, destroying all the evidence on her phones and on all her devices. They did That was not intentional. She didn't mean to bleach and destroy and hammer away at her phones. That was just one of those, you know, that happens. So you got a hammer in your hand, there's a phone, you know, who knows? You, Pouring, uh, you know, a bleach program in there that wipes things it just can happen accidentally. But Trump was acting intentionally when he had a bunch of boxes lying around Mar-a-Lago. But they can explain, you know, you, you think there's kind of it's kind of unfair, but they can explain the difference here. This is cut three. We have one set of laws in this country and they apply to everyone. No one is above the law. Uh, the law is a law and no one should be above it. And yes, nobody is above the law. No one is above the law. No one else is above the law. Okay, so, so clearly they're not making reference to the moral law there. They're making reference to the law they invented in their theories and in their ivory towers. It's not recognizable by any ordinary human standards, like love your neighbor or do unto others, the basics like that. But it is a law which is, says that we will prosecute people we dislike because we hate you so, so much. We're not here to do our jobs. We're not here to enforce law. We're here to express how much we hate you, and it is so, so much. So a second whistleblower, an IRS investigator, has come forward to say that there should have been felony tax charges leveled against Hunter Biden, and they should have been able to speak to other people who might have implicated other Bidens, including the president or at least the then vice president of the United States. The new West IRS whistleblower is now, he was called Whistleblower X before, but he's now known to be Joseph Ziegler. Here is his comment 
to a, a congressional hearing has cut 17. I hope that I am an example to other LGBTQ people out there who are questioning doing the right thing at the potential cost of themselves and others. We should always do the right thing, no matter how painful the process might be. I kind of equate this to experience and feelings I encountered when coming out. It was honestly one of the hardest things I ever had to go through. I contemplated scenarios that would have been highly regrettable, but I did what is right and I'm standing in, or I'm sitting here in front of you today. Now, this guy is obviously a very different character than Jason Aldean, who wrote, wrote that song about how some things are right and some things are wrong. But he's saying the same thing. He's saying that as a gay man, it was very hard for me to come out, but it was the right thing to do. And as a Democrat, which he also is, it's hard for him to come out and face down Democrats to tell the truth. But that is also the right thing to do. He is not putting, he is putting the color of his hat above everything else. He is putting whether he is a good guy or a bad guy above everything else. And as I say, there were a lot of people in the administration who kept stopping him, especially when he would try to extend the, the investigation to people beyond Hunter Biden, like, for instance, his father and other people like that. He was told not to do it. Here he is being interviewed at CBS by the great Catherine Herridge. Cut eight. Why did you want to interview Hunter Biden's adult children? So a lot of the um, business deductions expenses related to the adult children. Did you get the approvals? So we never received the approvals to to talk to, to, to those people. What did the assistant U.S. attorney tell you? That that's going to get us into hot water. Is that in the IRS handbook, avoiding hot water? No, but I mean, I was asking to do these certain things and roadblock after roadblock was put up in front of me. Roadblock after roadblock. So in other words, the people who are supposed to do a, a job are corrupted by their hatred. Hatred does that to you. It, it takes away the values that we all know to be true in our hearts. We all have a map of the, of the moral world in our hearts. It's, it's not that dissimilar. People always say, oh, in one culture it's this, in one culture it's that. But it's actually not. There are universal truths that all human beings hold to. These are the small town truths Jason Aldean is talking about and that th this gay Democrat is also talking about. But you lose those when your hatred makes you put other things in front of those. And it's not, you know, we talk about politics all the time, but this is happening in the medical industry where they are butchering children and making up excuses for it on the basis of zero percent science. There's an article this week in the Wall Street Journal by a clinical psychologist named Andrew Hartz. Now, as you know, I was deeply helped by counseling, by psychiatric counseling when I was a young man and went nuts. And my wife is a therapist and I have been a counselor on hotlines. And I will tell you that I counseled people and the people I know and the therapists I know, and I know a number of them, counsel people, whether they're Democrats or Republicans. I once counseled a Satanist to get to the place where they are going to be their best self. Now, obviously, if you're your best self, you're not going to be a Satanist. But still, you, you know, you might be. There are good people who are Democrats and good people who are Republicans. You just That's not what you're there for. But now in this article by uh, Andrew Hartz, this psychologist, he says the ideologies that have infiltrated education, medicine, and the legal profession have also inv invaded mental health care. Now listen to this and remember people who come to counselors are in distress, they're in emotional distress. He says the American Psychological Association has decried traditional masculinity. The Journal of the American Psychoanalytic Association published a paper describing whiteness as a malignant, parasitic-like condition. This is hate, hate, hate bubbling into this field. Two years ago, a prominent psychiatrist speaking at Yale shared her fantasies of killing white people. Recently, the president of the APA's Division of Psychoanalysis said that therapists should center Palestine as a central working tenet of any clinical practice. So you come in because your wife has left you, or you come in because you have sexual problems, or financial problems, or emotional problems, and they have to get your ideas right about Palestine before we can move forward. The most recent APA psychoanalysis conference, which has in the past focused on the practice of therapy, was absorbed by identity politics such as the white supremacist within and psychic colonization. To quote two panel titles, they th those are two of the uh, pan panel titles. Whatever it is, they can't do their job because they're so full of hate. And as we're about to see, they can't even stick to their own values. 
Did you know that poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, and lower productivity? Of course you do. You just have to look at me. Sleep is the foundation of our mental and physical health and performance in our days. That's why I'm like this. I never sleep. Having a consistent nighttime routine, non-negotiable. If you're struggling with sleep, you need to check out Beam. Beam's top-selling Beam Dream has a new formula. Dream contains a powerful, all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, and apigen in to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and help you wake up refreshed. Just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth, and enjoy before bedtime. And today, my listeners get a special discount on Beam's delicious Dream Powder, their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar, now available in delicious flavors like cinnamon cocoa and chocolate peanut butter. Better sleep has never tasted better. If you want to try Beam's best-selling Dream Powder, get up to 40% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash Clavin and use code Clavin at checkout. That's shopbeam.com slash Clavin and use code Clavin for up to 40% off. You got to know how to spell Clavin, K-L-A-V-A-N, so I will know that you're sleeping well while I'm lying awake. Chapter two, they hate us more than they cherish their values. Hilarious article in Axios. They recently wrote a piece about Biden telling you what I've been telling you about Biden all this time. He is not just corrupt. He is also a mean, nasty little POS. The guy, he always has been. This idea of lunch bucket Joe and the Senate whisper and all this stuff. He's always been a mean little man, especially with people who have less power than he does. So Alex Thompson wrote this piece saying behind closed doors, Biden has such a quick trigger temper that some aides try to avoid meeting alone with him. His aides don't want to meet alone with the president. Some take a colleague almost as a shield against Against the solo blast, the president's uh, admonitions include blank, damn it, how the F, don't you know this, don't effing bull me and get the F out of here. I can't, I can't even say it on the air. According to current and former Biden aides who have witnessed and been on the receiving end of such outbursts, Jeff Connaughton, a former Biden campaign and Senate aide, wrote that as a senator, Biden was a, quote, egomaniacal autocrat determined to manage his staff through fear. Okay, so he's a mean little punk. He always, he's always been this guy. He's a bully. Lots of pals are nasty. You know, lots of bull- politicians have big personalities and hot tempers. Here's the reaction to this from The View. Cut nine. She's turned on by Biden's anger. I am too. I like it. You like it? I do. Well, you have said that before. I like that. I mean, he's such a mild-mannered, sweet guy. He's, but you know he's not. We've heard, listen, he has dropped more F-bombs than Uncle, I have. Uncle Joe over, the years. Uncle you know, Joe over the years. Uncle Joe has done years. that. I mean, over the years, we've heard him off mic say stuff. I mean, he is a, he's a regular guy. I don't know what she's talking about. Well, he doesn't, she doesn't like this. She doesn't I like that. I don't think it's whippy that it's like anger management, and he needs anger management. Uh-huh. He just blows off steam. It's white male privilege, it's called. So white male privilege, see, now you know, if you want to sleep with Joy Behar, uh, all you got to do is be a demented, have dementia-related rage, uh, slobber a little bit, and white male privilege. He loves that white male privilege. There's nothing that turns, I know some of you are like, after I said, if you want to sleep with Joy Behar, you were trying to tear out your ears. Uh, you didn't want to hear that, but but okay, it was just a joke. But still, you know, now suddenly, suddenly white male privilege is what Joy Behar loves. She hates you so much. She is willing to throw away all her values. Whoopi Goldberg, he's a regular guy. He's a regular guy. He's he's the most powerful man in the world. He is the most powerful. He doesn't know it but because he doesn't know where he is, but he is the most powerful man in the wor- world. When people come into his office, they are less powerful than him by definition, and he is bullying them. He's a bully. So, you know, Trump could bully people. When he bullied people, you heard me. I know you heard me because you would write to me and angrily about it. And I would say it is wrong. He treats people badly. I would say that about Trump because I'm not going to, I don't hate the left. I don't hate anybody enough to get rid of my values, but their values go right under the bus the minute they have a chance to get at you or defend their own. So, Senator Chuck Grassley has released the document that the FBI has been hiding from the public. First, remember this. Just remember this. First, the FBI wouldn't turn it over at all. Then they said, oh, we'll give you a peek. We'll give you a quick peek. You know, you had to run by the FBI building and Christopher Ray would come out and sort of pull it out of his jacket and say, look, you know, but if you wanted to read it, it was a little hard. Finally, he caved in and he let them read it. Still would not give them a copy of it, but Grassley got it from a whistleblower. And the document is not... 
<laughs> it's not a smoking gun. I, I want to be dead straight honest with you. It's not, it's not proof of anything. But a highly paid, trusted FBI informant says he spoke to the head of Burisma Energy, Mikola Zlokevsk, this energy company that paid Hunter Biden, I think it was like $80,000 a month for no apparent reason, paid him off. This, this informant, this whistleblower, had a conversation, several conversations with this guy, the head of Burisma, saying that he had paid out $10 million in bribes to Hunter and then Vice President Joe Biden to help them smooth over Burisma's move into the American market. And we know that Joe Biden bragged about getting the guy fired, the prosecutor fired, who was investigating Burisma. He went in and threatened to deny Ukraine American aid if they didn't do what is essentially a personal favor. Now, you remember that Donald Trump was impeached for asking the Ukrainians to investigate Joe Biden, but Joe Biden is not going to be impeached for the fact that apparently he he was at, he actually used American aid to bribe a country into doing his bidding for his personal reasons. Now, listen, like I said, this is not a smoking gun. There's no proof here, but there are a couple of things that are important. First, it sounds accurate because this guy, the head of Burisma, whose name I can't pronounce, said his dog was smarter than Hunter Biden. So that sounds very accurate, very specific. Obviously, he was dealing with the real Hunter Biden there. And more important, he said he had I think it was 18 recordings, some of which implicated Joe Biden. So the question is, where are those recordings? Does the FBI have those too? You remember again that the Russian collusion hoax was keyed off, that investigation was keyed off by a casual comment, a guy who barely knew Donald Trump made in a bar overseas, but this from a highly paid, highly trusted whistleblower doesn't seem to have set off any kinds of investigations at all. They keep claiming the investigation has been ended. Uh, Bill Barr says that's not true. The question is, where are the tapes? And the Democrats are telling us, oh, the FBI, the FBI, this is the FBI. They've been so fair, so good. What what are they they trying to hurt the FBI? Here's Jamie Raskin, who is the ranking member, I believe, the ranking minority member on the Oversight Committee, uh, talking about this, how mean the Republicans are being to the FBI. Cut 18. The Republican majority on the committee is getting everything they're asking for uh, in terms of seeing the document, which, by the way, they say they have also already seen. Um, and yet they're still talking about holding the director of the FBI in contempt, even though they're getting exactly what they want, even though the FBI has been overwhelmingly cooperative and accommodating uh, to this request. Now, the lies are obvious. They have not been cooperative. They have not been accommodating. They have been uh, recalcitrant. They have been restrained. They have chased this committee around or made the committee chase them around. But what I love especially is that tone. They want to hold the director of the FBI in contempt, the FBI who we love and trust so much. The Democrats have hated the FBI since it was a dream in J. Edgar Hoover's mind. They hate the FBI. Here is the far left site Salon, an article by a guy named David Machiotra, quoting the ACLU. So you can't get any lefter than Salon and the ACLU. You put those two together, you are so far left, you actually have left the building, okay? The ACLU issued a 2013 report on the FBI's routine abuses of its authority in the post-9-11 era. Here's what they said. Here's from the ACLU. Since 9-11, the ACLU has uncovered and documented persistent evidence of FBI abuse, including warrantless wiretapping, racial and religious profiling, biased counterterrorism training materials, politically motivated investigations, abuse of detention and interrogation practices, and misuse of the no-fly list to recruit informants. Salon goes on. The report also documents how the FBI has implemented a hideously autocratic set of policies meant to avoid accountability and deceive the public. That is what the left thinks of the FBI, that they have a hideously autocratic set of policies meant to avoid accountability and deceive the public. The ACLU says the internal suppression of whistleblowers and often misleading testimony to Congress has effectively thwarted independent oversight of the Bureau, allowing violations of the civil liberties and privacy rights of people inside of and outside of the United States to continue unabated. If 
the left and the Democrats did not hate you so, so much, they would be saying, well, we hear your complaints, Republicans, and we love Joe Biden, but still, your complaints are our complaints. We're saying the same thing. But Rolling Stone writes, oh, this hearing where they're here, you know, they held a hearing, a whistleblower hearing, uh, where they questioned Christopher Wray. It was a circus with Republicans pressing Wray about various conspiracy theories and generally doing whatever they could to portray the FBI as a corrupt extension of the Biden administration, which is what it is exactly what it is. Hollywood, if you remember, even made a hagiography of bent cop James Comey. Do you remember to this? to support the bogus investigation into Trump's Russian collusion, which we now know was a dirty trick played by Hillary Clinton and had nothing to do with Russia or collusion or Trump. Other than that, it was Trump-Russia collusion, except it had nothing to do with any of that. It was a dirty trick. They made this film that was called The Comey Rule, in which it was a hagiography of, of James Comey. Here is also far-left actor Jeff Daniels, cut 10. They're trying to walk a line between, in America, the political left and the political right. Um, they are apolitical, and and that's what Comey was. He was he was that guy, not allowing politics of either side, either party, any party, to influence what their decisions are. Their decisions are based on the rule of law, justice, straight down the road. I cannot believe I am listening to this leftist talking about the FBI just walking the line straight down the road, just doing the right thing. That FBI, we love them so much. Their values out the window. There's Jeff Daniels, a Hollywood actor, telling you that everything that he truly believes is false because now you're saying it and he hates you so much. Again, I just want to emphasize this. The people doing this, the people who hate you this much, the people who are willing to throw away their values to corrupt their jobs, which Jeff Daniels is doing too when he plays uh, James Comey like that. They are in the minority. There's an NBC poll out just a few weeks ago that reported that the public's positive view of the FBI is at 37%. It was at 52% in 2018. So people see with their eyeballs what's happening. Christopher Wray, this is uh, Dan Henninger writing in the Wall Street Journal, Christopher Wray can sit before Congress placidly explaining away Republican discomfort with his agency all he wants, but it looks to me as if his organization is in the red zone among Republicans. Support for the FBI is 17%. 17%. So, People don't trust the FBI because they see it's become corrupted at the very top. This is even on the left. The leftist Salon said this. Anyone with minimal sanity should agree that the United States has an imperative to excise the Trump tumor from the White House. This is how much they hate him. He's a Trump tumor. This is when he's president, right? They should get him out by whatever means necessary. But, but if the alternative is John Brennan, Michael Hayden, James Comey, and all the subterfuge and indifference to suffering that accompanies men of their ilk, then we might as well remove the quaint notion of democracy from the executive branch of government along with its current occupant. So in other words, even these people who hate Donald Trump at Salon, who hate Donald Trump so much, they hate him so much they call him a tumor, they still are not going to bolster up the FBI because they know they're dirty. They're not going to bolster up James Homey and John Brennan, who CNN and uh, MSNBC had on their show every week. But these guys hate you so, so much. The small minority of leftists who are not even, the, they're running the Democrat Party, but they're not the Democrat Party. They hate you so, so much. They hate you more than they cherish their own values. Now, we talk so much here about how important it is to get a good night's sleep. And I have a lot of time to think about this because I never sleep. But getting a good night's sleep is essential for your physical, mental, and emotional well-being. That's why you need to check out Helix Mattress. Helix has harnessed years of extensive mattress expertise to bring their customers a truly elevated sleep experience. Well, for me, because I use a Helix and it gives me an elevated waking up experience. They just launched their new Helix Elite. The Helix Elite collection includes six different mattress models, each tailored for specific sleep positions and firmness preferences. Helix provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences, such as if you're a hot sleeper, a side sleeper, or like me, a non-sleeper. I've had my Helix for years. I love it. They even have a sleep quiz that matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress, because why would you buy a mattress made for someone else? Go to helixsleep.com slash Clavin. Take their two-minute sleep quiz to find the perfect mattress for your body and sleep type. Their flexible payment plans make it so that a great night's sleep is never far away. And for a limited time, 
Helix is offering up to 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for my listeners. This is their best offer yet, so hurry over to helixsleep.com slash Clavin with Helix Better Sleep. Starts now if and only if you can spell Clavin. No ease in Clavin. I just make it look this easy. There are no easy things. Chapter three. They don't know why they hate us. I hate, hate, hate your hair and makeup today. (laughs) All right, it's the hair and makeup. Never mind. All week long, I have been reading articles about why they hate us by the left. Why there's so much hatred in the country. That's the, the way they phrase it. Why are we so divided? And if you want to know what the left thinks, the best place to go is the op ed page of the New York Times, or as we call it, Knucklehead Row. Knucklehead Thomas Edsel writes a column this week, gut-level hatred is consuming our political life. Divisions between Democrats and Republicans have expanded far beyond the traditional fault lines based on race, education, gender, the urban-rural divide, and economic ideology. Polarization now encompasses sharp disagreements over the significance of patriotism and nationalism, as well as a fundamental split, listen carefully, a fundamental split between those seeking to restore perceived past glories and those who who embrace the future. Love that language. No bias there whatsoever. We are trying to restore perceived past glories. We're trying to bring back something that was never there in the first place, and they are embracing, giving a big hug to the teddy bear of the future. He goes on, Mark Hetherington, a political scientist at the University of North Carolina, described the situation this way in an email to me, to Edsel. He said, because political beliefs now reflect deeply held worldviews about how the world ought to be, challenging traditional ways of doing things on the one hand and putting a break on that change on the other, partisans look across the aisle at each other and absolutely do not understand how their opponents can possibly understand the world as they do. Now, keep that in mind. They always pose this as progress on the left and not progress. They want to move forward. We don't. So just keep that in mind. He goes on. We have these levels of polarization today. Hetherington continued, because of the gains non-dominant groups had made over the last 60 years. The Democrats no longer apologize for challenging traditional hierarchies and established pathways. They revel in it. Republicans see a world changing around them uncomfortably fast, and they want it to slow down, maybe even take a step backward. But if you are a person of color, a woman who values gender equality or an LGBT people, LGBT person, would you want to go back to 1963? I doubt it. So that's the analysis. They want to go forward and include all these people, and we don't. We want to go backward. We want to say it was better in the good old days, and why would anybody want to do that? What's being subtracted from the picture here is morality, that normal, basic, do unto others, social web morality that Aldine was talking about, Jason Aldine was talking about in that song, Try That in a Small Town. People who live in a culture where they know each other, where they love their neighbor, doesn't matter what color he is, he's just your neighbor. They are the people who have a, some sort of sense that there is a moral law and you can't just think it away, you can't explain it away. So this is why Republicans have always been at the forefront, for instance, of a colorblind society from Lincoln on. I want to move forward. I want to move forward in such a way that we fulfill our ideals. You're not a hypocrite if you can't fulfill your ideals, if you're moving toward those ideals. That's what an ideal is. You never really reach your ideal, but you can be moving toward it. I want the moral order to stay in place while we move toward it, because we're the ones out of whack, not the moral order. For instance, a multi-ethnic nation based on liberty is one of the coolest ideas white people ever had. Only white people White Christian people, the only people who ever had that idea, well, maybe that's not fair. Only white white people will say, because the Romans sort of had it. Show me a country that was not originally white, where there's now vastly multi-ethnic and all-inclusive. You can't. That You can't do it. It's not happening in China, not happening in Africa. This is an idea that white people had. So thanks, white people. Thank you, Christian white people, for including all of us in your great idea. That is a wonderful thing. I like it. I'm, I'm, I'm down. If that's the future, I'm down. Join the party. You get freedom and we get good food. We get better music. We get hot girls of all different colors. Perfect. That's the way I want it. But, but if you move forward, if you want to be included, but in being included, you want to destroy the thing you wanted to be included in, 
You can't do that. That's not fair because you wanted to be included because it was good. You wanted to be included because it was attractive, because it adhered to that moral order and built something beautiful out of it. Let's let's take the Jews as an example, all right? Because I'm always being accused by the far right on Twitter and other places. They're always accusing me of liking the Jews. I'm guilty. I'm fond of the Jews. I think Jews are great people. I grew up with Jews. Racially, I'm a Jew. I'm, I'm on that board. If that makes me part of a vast Jewish conspiracy, good. Just give me the space laser and let me play around with it, all right? Jews contribute a lot to society. I, you know, I, the, the interesting thing is people are always pointing to the powerful bad guys who are Jewish, uh, Soros and Madoff and Weinstein and Epstein. But The thing about that is, is the Jews are a very successful group of people, and they are successful for two reasons. They emphasize family, and they emphasize education. They emphasize the moral law. That's a third reason, too. Those are the reasons that Jews rise very high, because they emphasize community, family, reading, morality. That is why they rise high. And when an entire group of people rises high, that minority of bad people among them are going to be powerful people, just like the people who are good people Jews have won, I believe, more as a group, more uh, Nobel Prizes for science than any other group. They built Hollywood when Hollywood was one of the greatest American institutions we had, when it spread Americanism around the world. They have contributed many, many beautiful things. And like everybody, they have bad guys, and those bad guys are going to be successful, just like the Jews, because the Jews are successful people. I like them. I'm happy to have them. When they were excluded, as they, especially as they piled in during the 20th century, a lot of them came over and people started, anti-Semitism was on the rise. They said, you should let us in. They made movies saying you should let Jews in. Jews, you know, are part of the American scenery, which is now absolutely true. If they had come in and said, well, now that we're here, you have to get rid of Christianity because Christianity is what kept us out and we're angry. We hate Christianity. Christianity was mean to us. And now... No, no, you wanted to come in because white Christian men built a beautiful country that included the idea that you could be included because even George Washington said the Jews should be included and that people should not be kept out because of religion. You wanted into that. You have to now contribute. You say, thanks for opening the door. Your country was going great without us. That's why we wanted to come in. But now we're here. We can contribute. We can be Einstein. We can be comedians. We can be great uh, financial people and help you guys out and build the country you want. That's what the Jews mostly, mostly have done, and many blacks have done that too. Clarence Thomas wanted in. He wanted into the colorblind society that he was promised that he could see from the outside when he was a poor kid in a segregated society. He wanted into that society, and he came in, and now he wants to contribute to this society as it was, the society he wanted into because it was valuable, because it was valuable. See, I want to go forward too. I want Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court, the people who kept people off the Supreme Court, my heroes, the Tuskegee Airmen, the people who kept them from flying. Those are not, those guys are back in the past. They're gone, wave goodbye. Maybe they had good traits. Maybe they were perfect for their time, but now it's the future. So long to them. Happy to see them go. That's fine with me. Now you're in Thomas Sowell. Now you're allowed to be a top-notch intellectual, the top-notch intellectual, if you ask me. Great, because he's contributing to the society he wanted to be a part of the tiny, tiny minority, so full of hate for the past offenses, they want to get back at the country they want to be in. Those The, the black uh, activists, not the black people, the black activists who wanted to come in, said, please let us in, and now you let us in. We need reparations. We hate you. We want to destroy your country. We don't want this whiteness, this whiteness. California is now seeking to include tr- social justice in its math classes. Because leftists don't think black kids can add. That's why. The problem is not the black kids. Every time every time you bring poor black kids into a school and give them rigorous training, they do great. That is not the problem. The problem is the teachers' unions. They don't want to get rid of the teachers' union, so they're going to dumb down classes for black people. We all remember the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Remember that chart they put out? They apologized for this, but too damn late. They offered a chart listing hard work and rational thought as traits of white culture. That's how much they hate you. Even the best thing about you, they hate. That's just an amazing thing. So, so this narrative they're telling themselves that they want to move forward and we don't is not true. They don't know why they hate us. If that's what they think, they don't know why they hate us. And almost all the articles I read about this, by the way, were exactly, exactly like that. So, They say they want to move forward, but that's not it. What it is, is they have this new idea, this new academic theory with which they want to 
burn down the thing that they originally wanted to be a part of. They want to burn down cities, put your children, corrupt them with sexual theories. Why? Why do they want to do this? They, they hate us. They think that's progress, and they think we want to hold them back. But I say, and I'm, I don't even have to prove this, it's axiomatic, I say it's morality. I say that they have lost their moral way, and this is a part of why they hate us, an important part, because their theory is much, much bigger than we think it is. So if you're a few years or maybe three, four, five decades out of school and you wonder, what the heck did I even learn and what was the point? You might think to yourself that you don't have the time to learn something new, but you do. You're not alone. It's not too late. Since 1844, Hillsdale College has been providing education in faith, freedom, and character. You know I love these guys. They've taken some of the core classes they teach on campus. They've made them available for free online for anyone who wants to learn That's right, for free. There are 39 free courses to choose from, ranging from the U.S. Constitution, the Book of Genesis, to free market economics. They're easy to follow. They're self-paced, so you can start whenever you want. In fact, you can start right now. It's everything you need all in one place with no long-term commitment. Let Hillsdale College be your guide. Learn when and where you want. I took one of these courses, by the way. They're absolutely terrific. You can go right now to hillsdale.edu slash Claven to enroll. There's no cost. It's easy to get started. That's hillsdale.edu slash Claven to register. Hillsdale.edu slash Claven. Maybe you can even learn how to spell Claven. I'll tell you. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. Final chapter, the oldest hate. I want to go back to this article on Knucklehead Row, this article in the Times. The author talked to a lady named Arlie Hochschild, who is doing a study of eastern Kentucky. She's a sociologist at the University of California at Berkeley. And she has this really interesting experience. She's talking, interviewing people in this small Kentucky town. She says, I asked a Pikeville, Kentucky businessman why he thought the Democratic Party had become unhinged. Henry, as I'll call him here, studied his cell phone, then held it for me to see a video, and we've all seen this, I think, of two transgender activists standing on the White House lawn in Pride Week. One was laughingly shaking her naked prosthetic breasts, the other bare-chested, showing scars where breasts had been cut away. The clip then moved to President Biden saying, these are the bravest people I know. Now, they see this, obviously, as they want to move forward to cutting off their breasts and have and bearing their prosthetic breasts and calling that brave instead of ill, we don't want them to do that. So we're holding back progress, but that's not, of course, what it is. This is an actual clash of values. We are saying they are wrong. See, this is why they hated that song, Try That in a Small Town. He was saying there is right and there is wrong, and people in this, ordinary people, not even with PhDs, for the love of all heaven, ordinary people know what right and wrong is because they are made to know, because they are created to know, okay? So I I wanna talk about transgenderism and YouTube is gonna ding us for this and and shame on them, shame on them. They have no information by which to do this. It is a feeling they have that it is bad to do it, but it is because in the name of free speech, in the name of everything that's American, YouTube should shut the hell up about this because they should just be absolutely ashamed to uh, condemn people for speaking their minds on a subject that is well, well unsettled. So Richard Levine, the Admiral of the Ocean Waves, I no longer even know what his title is. uh, he, He was asked recently, This is the guy who goes by Rachel Levine. He was asked recently why people had to be trans as children. Why not wait? This is cut 13. Adolescence is hard and puberty is hard. What if you're going through the wrong puberty? What if you inside feel that you are female, but now you're going through a male puberty? So it's a really interesting comment. Now, I'm going to be frank. I believe this guy's a psycho. I believe that in a better time, a wiser time, a smarter time, this guy would be in a secure facility in a padded cell. This guy is the guy from the guy from the movie Psycho. He is he is destroying people's bodies to convince himself that he is something that he is not. That is what I believe of Richard Levine. And I think the fact that he is in power shows us that we're going through a dark time. And I've never lied to you about that. This is a dark time. You know, there's there's another side to it. There's another side to if we can get through it. But still, it is a dark thing that this guy is in there. And what he is saying is that your feelings about who you are are more important than who you are. And and this is the thing. Now, because of this underlying theory that replaces standard morality, right, 
It doesn't matter how you're born. It's, it, there's no good or bad about it. You just don't feel that that's what you want, so you should have something else. So many, the, people, the people who want to do this to children are disturbed because there's no proof of it. The feminist reporter, this is a feminist reporter, Genevieve Glug, Cluck, at the Redux Feminist site, right, found out that the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, WPATH, which describes itself as a 501c3 nonprofit, it's, it's basically a global group of, uh, of professionals who want to comment on the rules for transgender health, have new standards in which they include people who have a castration fetish. These are transgender people. Why not? Why not? Transgender people are men who essentially want to cut their testicles off. So if you just want to cut your testicles off because it seems like kind of fun, you're a transgender people. If you're inventing morality, and I think this is why this is why the left, the Guardian, the Washington Post, the Rolling Stone attack the movie uh, Sound of Freedom, which is an anti trafficking sexual the sexual trafficking of children and it's doing incredibly well while all their movies their woke movies are not doing incredibly well they attack it because conservative christians made it but they also attack it because it says this is bad that raping children is bad try that in a small town i don't have to tell you why it's bad it's bad everyone knows it's bad everyone including the people who do it that's why they lie about it but critical theory, which emanates from the Karl Marx strategy of ruthlessly criticizing all that exists, mean to take all this down, this natural morality, this sense that, the, that human beings have, this natural sense that bad things disgust us, that bad things repel us, that when you come in and you sucker punch somebody or carjack him or set your city on fire, that in a small town, a bunch of guys will come and kick your butt. That's just natural morality acting itself out. That is what Karl Marx is trying to get rid of, and that's what they are trying to get rid of. And it has to, I'm sorry, because I know that some of you say, oh, you shouldn't mention God because some of us don't believe in God. It doesn't matter. You can not believe in God all you want. I don't believe in Brazil, but still people live there. This is the line that I'm always telling you from the Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky, where the guy who hates God, the brother, the Karamazov brother Ivan, who hates God, says, for every person who believes neither in God nor his own morality, the moral law of nature ought to change immediately into the exact opposite of the former religious law. Egoism, even to the point of evil doing, should not only be permitted to man, but should be acknowledged as the necessary, the most reasonable, and all but the noblest result of the situation. So if you feel like you're in the wrong body, egoism demands that you can change that body. There is nothing to push against. There is no moral law to push against. And of course, as Dostoevsky taught us in Crime and Punishment, that's not true. If you violate the moral law, you, in fact, find yourself in a snare. You are caught. Why? Because the guilt and shame you feel can only be processed by admitting that you were wrong, and sometimes the bad, the evil that you've done cannot be undone. There's a journalist named Helen Joyce. I believe she's Irish. Uh, she's become an activism for pro activist for protecting women from trans aggression. And here she is talking about this phenomenon, Cut 11. There's a lot of people who can't move on on this um, because that's the people who've transitioned their own children. So those people are going to be like, you know, the Japanese soldiers who were on Pacific Islands and didn't know the war was over. Right. They've got to fight forever. This is why this is another reason why this is the worst, worst, worst social contagion that we'll ever have experienced. A lot of people have done the worst thing that you could do which is to harm their children irrevocably because of it. Those people will have to believe that they did the right thing for the rest of their lives, for their own sanity and for their own self-respect. And she goes on to say that that one person who has done this evil thing and can't turn back because that would mean facing the evil, the irreparable evil that they've done, can destroy entire uh, institutions and cultures too. This is cut 12. There are specific individuals who are really actively against women's rights here, and it's not known why they are, but I happen to know through the back channels that it's because they've trans their child. And so those people will do anything for the entire rest of their lives to destroy me and people like me, because people like me are a standing reproach to them. I don't want to be, I'm not talking directly to them, I don't spend my time bitching about them, but the fact is that just simply by saying, we will never accept natal males in women's spaces, well, it's their son that we're talking about. And they've told their son that he can get himself sterilised and destroy his, his um, sexual function and women will accept him as a woman. And if we don't, there's no way back for them and their child. 
There's only one system for getting out of the snares of evil once you've committed evil, once you've committed abortion, once you've castrated your child, once you've even done murder. There's only one way, and that is to repent and turn back and turn in another direction. And God, bizarrely, forgives you. I might not, but God will forgive you if you turn around and walk in his direction. That is why we believe in God. You know, the the, the great underlying question, the great underlying question of human life is, does it matter what we experience to be true. Does our, do our, our, our experiences real? Is our experience of a moral web just a random accident of game theory and evolution, or is it something we were given, that we were created with? Now, I know, I know that natural morality can make terrible mistakes. People can hold slaves and convince themselves they're good. They can wipe out whole peoples and convince themselves this was the right thing to do. But that's different than saying if you grow into the natural into your natural morality, you will get there eventually. Eventually, we we live in time and things have to develop over time and great evil can be done before people realize, oh, you know what? Holding slaves is not good because it's not what I would want done to me. That simple, simple rule, do unto others, right? This is the great question. Now, the other day, uh, there was a a great story. A neuroscientist, Christoph Koch, had bet David Chalmers, a philosopher 25 years ago, Chalmers, the the neuroscientist had said that science would in 25 years have an explanation for consciousness. The philosophers said, no, they won't, and no, they don't. And this is very common. Scientists say, we're going to know how life began in two years, but we have no clue how life began. We're going to know how the universe began in two years, and we, we we may never actually know. And always, always, they eventually decide, oh, you know, there's no answer because there's no question. That, you know, if science can't do it, then it can't be done. There's a really interesting book called God, Human, Animal, Machine by Megan O'Geeblin, a writer who was grew up as a fundamentalist Christian and lost her faith. And she says the success, I'm paraphrasing this a little bit, but it's a quote, the success of science has required sidelining the world of the mind because the mind was too complicated for science to understand, so they put it to side. And that eventually led to the conclusion that because consciousness cannot be studied scientifically, it does not exist. Subjective experience has come to seem to scientists entirely uh, unreal. In other words, it's a hallucination. Now, I always ask, if it's a hallucination, who's it a hallucination to? It's a hallucination to me, but they are saying me, my consciousness, does not exist. Because when all you have is a hammer, if it ain't a nail, it isn't there. Consciousness, the self, is an illusion. We're just atoms accidentally floating around and nothing we think matters. And that's at the bottom of transgenderism, because transgenderism is not just transgenderism. There's a book a fairly influential book called From Transgender to Transhuman by Martine Rothblatt, who I believe is Martin Rothblatt, a guy, uh, Rothblatt, a guy pretending to be a girl. But he's a successful businessman. And he says that transgenderism, that gender assignment, being a man or woman, is apartheid. Saying that you're a man or woman, therefore you have to do certain things like have babies and not have babies, that's, that's just apartheid. We're going to get past all of that. And once we get past that, we should get past our bodies all together. To be transhuman, he, he or she says, one has to be willing to accept that they have a unique personal identity beyond flesh or software and that this unique personal identity cannot be happily expressed as either human or not. It requires a unique transhuman expression. So we're, transgenderism is just a step. Uh, he is not the only person saying this. It's just a step on the way to being transhuman, which means you can download your brain into a computer and that computer will then be you. And it's not a paradox at all, by the way, that in Davos, that crazy guy, Klaus Schwab, he pictures us all living in these little anthills of societies, you know, all kind of controlled from Davos and just cooperating with each other. Because if each of us is entirely individual, if we have no common human nature that includes our gender, if we have no common human nature, if women are not women, if men are not men, then the only way to form us into a society is is through oppression. You have to get rid of all those things we argue about. Faith and love and desire and ambition, all those things have to go away. And that's why that ideal dream that John Lennon had in that song, Imagine, imagine no religion, no countries, no heaven, no hell. We don't have to worry. We don't have to have wars. We don't have to have anything. It sounds exactly like the scene from Invasion of the Body Snatchers, where the body snatchers explain why it's great to be a robot. Cut 14. You can't love or be loved, am I right? You say it as if it were terrible. Believe me, it isn't. You've been in love before. It didn't last. It never does. Love. 
desire, ambition, faith. Without them, life's so simple, believe me. I don't want any part of it. You're forgetting something, Miles. What's that? You have no choice. <laughs> it's just great, but you have no choice whether you want it or not. Here it comes. This is not really hatred of us. It's the oldest hatred in the world, which is the hatred of God. The hatred of God is as old as Adam and Eve. It shows up in a million ways. It shows up as Jew hatred because they're the chosen people of God. It shows up as racism because that's hatred of the image of God. And it shows up as misogyny because that is the aspect of God that takes away our independence and basically says that power the hatred of femininity is the hatred of the fact that there is an aspect of God that says power has to serve creation, that creation comes first and power has to protect and serve creation as men protect and serve their women and their families. More than anything else, though, it shows up in people who want to reinvent the moral order, which happened at the very beginning of time in the Garden of Eden. You know, God, when he saw that Adam and Eve had eaten the apple and learned the difference of good and evil, said we have to throw them out of the of paradise or they will eat of the tree of life. They have now, like gods, to know good and evil, so we can't let them live forever. That's what he said. And I used to think that that was jealousy, that he was trying to protect, God was trying to protect his power. But no, what he was saying was they are like gods, but they're not gods. It's as if he said, oh, look, they put on Superman's cape. We've got to take them off the roof before they jump to their deaths. This hatred of God, of the moral order that restrains our desires, that restrains our desires. This is what people hate the most and is what is powering the hate that is devouring, dividing our country. It's not they want to go forward, we want to go back. It's we want to stick to the road that is laid out by the moral law. And they are a very, very small number of perverted and intellectual people who want to theorize away the moral truth that ordinary people know in their bones. We'll try that in a small town See how far you make it down the road Our friends over at GenuCell sold out of their dark spot corrector. Our listeners were begging for a restock. It was pitiful, the weeping, the crying. It was terrible. Well, I have great news. It's back in stock. GenuCell's famous dark spot corrector has not one but three cutting edge ingredients and goes to work fast to target sunspots, dark spots, liver spots, and even old discoloration both on your face and hands. You can now enjoy your summer sun, beach, and barbecues without embarrassing spots. GenuCell's most popular package also features their summer essentials like the best-selling Ultra Retinol Moisturizer with a powerful retinol alternative for safe use in the sun. You'll be amazed at how quickly you'll see results or 100% of your money back guaranteed. A lot of the girls at The Daily Wire use this. They love the dark spot corrector. They say they can't get along without it. Go to GenuCell.com slash Clavin right now to get your dark spot corrector in the GenuCell most popular package. That's GenuCell.com slash Clavin right now and save over 70% off GenuCell's most popular package. All orders will include a mystery luxury gift while supplies last. GenuCell.com slash Clavin. I'll tell you a secret. Some of the guys use it here too. It's not just for girls. And I'll tell you another secret. It's K-L-A-V-A-N. No ease in Clavin. There are no ease in Clavin. When Jordan Peterson made the decision to join Daily Wire Plus, it was a major win for those who champion free speech and intellectual debate. With one year of unparalleled output, his contributions have set new standards and remain unmatched by any other platform. Daily Wire Plus now has a vast array of exclusive Jordan Peterson content, offering hundreds of hours of captivating content you won't find anywhere else. Jordan has created thought-provoking works that reshape your perspective on life, which include vision and destiny, marriage, and dragons, monsters, and men. Additionally, you can immerse yourself in discussions that nurture your spiritual side, like logos and literacy, and Jordan's groundbreaking series on the book of Exodus. And that's only the beginning. I haven't even mentioned his Beyond Order lecture series or his extensive archive of lectures and podcasts. This is the absolute compendium of all things Jordan. Plus, there's even more new exclusive content on the horizon. This is only the beginning. By becoming a Daily Wire Plus member, you'll embark on an unforgettable experience that will fuel your thirst for knowledge and inspire personal growth like never before. Go to dailywire.com slash subscribe to become a member today. We've got a lot of stuff coming up. On Wednesday, I'm going to have a conversation with my son, Spencer Clavin, no relation, and Michael Knowles. So, all right, that detracts a little bit. No, but Michael is also going to have a, an interview on Wednesday with 
the QAnon shaman, if you've ever wondered what it would have been like to take a stroll through the Capitol on January 6th or walk on the surface of the sun, well, you're in luck because the newest guest on Michael Knowles' show, Michael and his firsthand experience with at least one of those things. Don't miss the first long-form interview with Jacob Chansley since he was released from jail. You may know him better as the QAnon shaman or the horn hat guy from January 6th. Here's a teaser. You were in um, solitary confinement for, for ten and a half months. Ten and a half months. That seems like torture. And I experienced some miraculous things in solitary. I'm freaking out. I'm in a cell. I'm freaking out. I'm like, what the hell? And I had a Bible in my hand. I said, I need you to speak with me. So I, I close my eyes, I open the Bible, I point to a random verse, and the verse was, I am yours and you are mine. I have redeemed you and called you by name, O Jacob. Oh yeah. I, I want to know where he got that hat. Also, what's a shaman and what is a woman? What really happened on January 6th, find out in this trippy interview out now. The big tech-approved version of this episode is on YouTube, but be sure to catch the uncensored version exclusively on Twitter and Daily Wire+. Plus. All right, Clavin Clapbacks. Woo! Cocaine is a hell of a drug. Yeah! <laughs> Clavin Clapbacks. Clapbax is spelled K-L-A-P Bax. Uh, Clavin Clapbax at dailywire.com is where you can send your comments. Please comment on the show. Tell us what you agree with, what you disagree with. Uh, tell us why you hate us, why you love us, uh, but you should love us. Uh, this one from Andy. You have stated in your show that art is subjective but not relative. However, when discussing the Narnia books, you have also said that there is no accounting for taste. How can these two statements exist simultaneously? It's easy. There are lots and lots of good things in the world that I don't prefer. I mean, the ocean is beautiful, but I prefer to look at the hills. My wife prefers to look at the ocean. And I would never say, oh, that's wrong. It's simply taste. I admit that they are both great things. Uh, the same way I admit that Moby Dick may be a great book, that it's just not to my taste. From Mac Cannon, Hot Gandalf, why is the ending in Casablanca so perfect? Why am I wrong for wanting Rick and Ilsa to end up together? You're not wrong, but that's why it's perfect, because it causes you to experience the sacrifice that Rick is making, that Rick and Ilsa are both making. So that is what art does. Is art is not just there to, you know, like a like an encyclopedia to give you information. It is there to put you through an experience, and they put you through the experience of heartbreaking sacrifice. You want it, so does he, but he's giving it up for a greater good. From Tyler, I took exception to your characterization of all good people, but particularly Christians, as hypocrites. The new covenant is not just a religious reordering. It is not just a new sacrificial system. It is a transformation. When the Christian lives in godliness, he lives according to his true nature, his true identity. When a Christian sins, he is violating his true nature, not acquiescing to it. I agree. I think it's cynical at best to describe those who fight that fight as hypocrites. No. First of all, it's not me calling Christ followers hypocrites. It was Christ calling Christ followers hypocrites. Not for, fa for trying and failing, but for judging those who tried and failed when they themselves were trying and failing, for deluding themselves that they had succeeded, that they were now what they were supposed to be and were therefore in a position to judge other people. Uh, in other words, that they had removed the plank from their eyes and could now judge other people, the speck in other people's eyes. That's why he called them hypocrites. That's why I think we're all a little bit hypocritical. From Anonymous, I just finished Brave New World by Huxley, and there are a lot of Shakespeare references and quotes. You have been speaking a lot about Shakespeare as of late, and I wonder what you think of Huxley's constant flow of Shakespeare quotes using John's character. First of all, I love this book. I thought it was a really, really entertaining book. But what he's saying about Shakespeare, Shakespeare is just what we were talking about in the show today. Shakespeare teaches you the human, and the John is a savage. He starts out as a savage, but he reads Shakespeare and it civilizes him. And so he comes into a world where, for instance, women just have sex without thinking about who it is. I know it's insane. It's not a world that we would ever live in. But in this world, they just have sex for fun and they don't care about it at all. And he cares about virtue. He cares about virginity. He cares about a woman remaining pure until it is time not to be. And so he goes, he goes insane, essentially, in this brave new world. He is talking about discovering the human. We're going to keep talking about all kinds of things in the member block, but you can't come if you're not a member, so go to dailywire.com slash subscribe and use code Claven at checkout for two months free on all annual plans. Do it fast before the Clavenless week begins and come on over to member block.